Professor Bright here. Welcome back to the Sunless Skies. I can't undock. There we go. Not sure why the lag with the undocking. Do know why the music is not playing because, well, I did sort of pause here for a moment because I was considering this and I decided to take along what bombazine we had for this very simple, very peaceful trip to well, first, first to Port Avon, but I don't remember if I sold my port reports, so let's go here real quick. I'm pretty sure I didn't. And if I did, well, we just wasted a little bit of fuel. Not that much. It's fine. Um, oh, no, I actually did... Harumph. Wasted some fuel. Oh, well. But yes, tonight we are just doing a simple... Simple job. Just Port Avon, Carillon, Lustrum. Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong at all. It'll be fine. All will be well. And uh, maybe most of us will survive it. I actually do think this is a relatively safe route. Uh, Lustrum a little bit less so than the other two, but... Meh. We should be fine. We should be fine. <laughs> ah, deary, dear me. Nothing to worry about. It would be nice if these turrets actually, you know, functioned. Well, here's a lag of loading. Which does appear to have gotten more severe rather than less. I'm not sure why. <sighs> Disturbing. But I can't think of a cause, so I can't really do anything about it at the moment. Unless... Hello. Uh, give us a moment. I'm just noticing some severe lag all of a sudden. What the hell? Um. Oh, hold up. Could that have been the cause? I mean, in the worst case, I can always... I think that was the cause. Okay. Well, that is irritating, but here we are. Hello, friend. Ah, oh, you're gonna make it a pain to get into the sides of you, aren't you? All right, buddy. There's my buddy doing his work. Let's see here. And fire. And fire again. Oop, nope. There we are. And, oh, I mistimed that, but... Oh, well. Um, hmm. Well. I mean, deploy the canning equipment. Enough remains of the creature to extract several meals of tasteless mush. So why not? Isn't that a good choice? Saws buzz, shell hammers pound, vices squeeze. Once the parts are separated, your cook is able to scoop rich jelly from beneath the carapace. Oh, God. And solve a tangle of corded muscles in the tenderizer. It's enough to fill several large cans. That sounds disgusting. Ministry secrets, please? Thank you. Ah. Uh, tragic. Oh, not so tragic. You know, I do have use for permits, so... There we are. Always have use for them. Though perhaps a cryptic benefactor would have benefited me more, but, well. Choice has been made. Nope. Get back over here so I can kill you. There we are. Hmm. Hmm. I'll just gain the sovereigns, thank you very much. Hmm. Didn't read that partial success. Probably should have, but... Choice made. It's not massively important, but I think I just saw something potentially interesting. Something about predatory shapes within the carapace of the cantankery, which I don't know what those would be. Unless it was infested with guests. Mm. Can guests infest organisms? Fair question. I don't know. I would assume yes, but one never knows. One never knows. A quiet day in Port Avon. A pleasant breeze wafts through the village, making even its pricklier residents relax their guard and welcome guests. 
Only a little, but enough that even a visiting stranger can enjoy their bonhomie. Um... Yeah, I'll take that. Thanks. Oh, and before I do anything else... Charmer and Sons? Oh, for souls, yes. I know this is going to help the stovepipes, but I need the money, so here we are. The Admiral's China, crockery for Port Havon. London's erratic Admiral is a tactical genius, but perilously fragile. Unless his daily routine adheres to exact specifications, his inspiration abandons him in the loss of his tea set, and a recent engagement has rendered him entirely ineffective. His Batman, currently recuperating at Port Avon, seeks an exact replacement. He will pay 110 sovereigns for each of up to five crates of nostalgic crockery. Port Avon lies to the southwest. Southwest. Southwest, thank you very much. Interesting. Hmm. The Admiral's Batman... Is it really that... Mm, okay. Rummages through the crockery with increasing excitement. Some of these might do. We'll soon have the Admiral back in the thick of things. Yes. Oh my yes. You just saved me a long trip. Balmazine has worked in the dark in candleless rooms with boarded windows. A milk-eyed weaver sells rolls of the cloth she has made in her cellar. It's black and splendid, drinking the starlight thirstily. And... I now have the materials to do that second job. Excellent, excellent, excellent. With some left over just to hold on to, but cool. We have reason to go to Lustrum. Uh, no, actually. Port Avon Doc, thank you very much. Yes, how is my welcome? I'm apparently welcome here, or at least welcome enough. Write a port report, and the locals are willing to update you on the news. There's not much to share. But it's worth money to the right people, so here we are. Commission the reclusive carpenter to repair the magician's equipment. You've been given a letter and several allegedly magical boxes to deliver to him. Oh. <sighs> well, the carpenter squints at the letter and gives a quite harumph. Another one? Fine. Looks like I'll need the legs of a can... Can tankery. Sorry, it sounded like someone... I'm going to assume that was a car skidding. Anyway. Uh, d -d -d a tad morbid, I know, but I require pliable joints such as they have. They don't seem to have jo mm, okay, sure. Also, they don't seem to have legs, now I'm thinking about it, but... Sure, why not? Um, see, I don't know what my level is, so... Share exotic gossip with the locals. I've got plenty of it. And it's well... It'll, we're welcome at level four. Okay, cool. Uh, that's enough for me. I can do more if need be, but right now I want to go to the Village Green, I believe. Or maybe not. Hello. The Auroral Sommelier. Someone has grafted brass wheels into the carcass of an old armoire and impaled its top with a jaunty damasked umbrella. What? Oh. Someone has grafted brass wheels to the carcass of an old armoire and impaled it. Da -da -da -da. A man stands behind it, fresh and finery, the colors of the dawn. Ugh. Shepherding customers through their sampling of wines. Sweet wines, sour wines, subtle wines, and sinful. Spirits of every vintage, save, of course, the Hesperidian cider. He gives a small, sad laugh. I know, because I loved. It's the only place with real apples, but even here, that cider eludes me. He beckons you with a gloved hand. Ask him about the Hesperidian cider. A rare vintage, unheard of and unseen since London. This merits investigation. Oh. Come here, come close and listen, you effervescent thing. I have a story, an associate of mine, he once gave me a sip of it. One golden drop to place under my tongue, and my life was changed. Our carnivorous pleasure steeps in his voice as he speaks. I went back to the store immediately, of course, but the price was too much. And then eventually the dreams drained away, and now I'm here, serving wine to drunks. His laughter is black and bitter, but the auroral... Sommelier gives you the address, nonetheless, just in case. If you decide to risk the same grief, savor it for me. Interesting. Yeah, Hesperidian Cider, as I recall, was supposed to make you immortal if you drank it. And I'm sorry, we do have one more thing to explore here. That is... curious. Did I go to the wrong place? Perhaps. Ah, the Nowhere Inn, I think it was. Head upstairs, the New Somerset Hunting Club. Has exclusive rights to the rooms above the pub. <laughs> above the pub, rather. Above the pub. There we go. 
as well as its finest brandies. Thick cigar smoke curls through the air, filling this private chamber with premium-grade fog. Bloated gentlemen in well-worn military uniforms sit at mahogany tables, sipping port. They chunter of the old days and how very much better they were. Hmm. Deliver a cantankery trophy. The club will pay to hang this on their wall. A stout veteran pokes it. What a horrible creature, he twirls his bushy mustache. A perfect centerpiece. Jenkins, fetch the hoist. Not very much, but fair. A course would be trophy. The glassy, multifaceted stare will reflect the firelight prettily. Mounted and delivered, the stout veteran looks deep into its eyes. Not so tough now, are we? He crows, Jenkins, fetch the nails. And our scribe's pinster. They made it to clear some extra space on the wall. The stout veteran refuses to touch it. In my day, we never had nonsense like this, you know. It was all marsh wolves and ambulatory fungus. Good, sensible hunting. I mean, what even is this? I feel like it's watching me and it doesn't even have eyes. Jenkins, put it somewhere I won't see it. <laughs> Fair. Now, ask about our membership. You filled their wall, now to talk about your membership. And what benefits we can gain from that. Ah, yes. The stout veteran twirls his bushy mustache. Mustache. Of course, you will be most welcome once the spot opens up. Dead men's shoes, I'm afraid. And our chaps do rather cling to their place at the bar, but do come and meet everyone. I'm certain they will be thrilled to hear your stories and slip your name to the right kind of people. You are first in line for membership to the new Somerset Hunting Club. You have technically been accepted into the club. Hmm. Fair. Oh, uh, I mean, we do have some terror. Appreciate an amount of cider. Made from real apples from the world you left behind. Careful now, a local warns you, placidly. Hmm. The taste is so sweet, so apply, so heart twangingly, breath catchingly nostalgic, that it would be easy to miss the kick. What a dangerous little beverage. You drink judiciously, and only allow yourself one more mug. Every sip reminds you of a world that is lost somewhere at the far end of the universe. Hmm. I do love the writing here. But it is time to go elsewhere. Specifically to Carillon, because that is where most of our business is. Technically, more of our business is in Lustrum, but. Carillon's something I wanted to explore, plus we need to fix our soul, so we're a little bit more, more worthy if we go back to Eleutheria. When we go back to Eleutheria? Well, mm, if we go back to Eleutheria. I will leave it at that. There's always the possibility I decide against it, but... Well, that seems slightly unlikely. At least in the long term, I think... For better or worse... I've decided my next move is going to be going to the Blue Kingdom, just because it is a new location, and I favor novelty over safety. For better or worse. Not the responsible decision, but, uh, well, you know, do as I say, not as I do. Rather bad philosophy and bad teaching, but, eh. Eh. I want it. And so I will go and deal with the consequences when they come up. Ah, uh, deary dear me. Do we have any other business in Caroline besides our aunt? I think we did. Something about a devil. Hmm. Well, a devil who wanted us to... Was it to remove a devil or something? I'm not entirely sure. It's been a lifetime since we've been here. Could be easily over a year. Probably is. An overgrown shrine. Uh, oh no. Don't steal an offering. That is a... Bad choice. Very bad choice. Hmm. Alright. Having prayed to that creature. Hmm. You need a clear soul to be admitted. I do have a clear soul. Among other flaws, I believe. Hmm. Find a devil at the Gaslight Terrace. Ah, that was what it was. Um, just because I can do this, though, it descends into a tunnel. Carved over the mouth of the tunnel are symbols of death, a skull, a flail, and a fly on its back. Visit the sand garden. The air is cold, the sand crunches underfoot. 
you will not be deterred. Not by fear, not by cold, not by hesitation or anxiety. You've chosen a way forward, that is all. In the pure blackness, you walk into a column of stone, no more than a column, a divide. No, more than a column, a divide, where the path goes left and right. You'll have to choose a way without reason. There's nothing here to determine which is best. Oh? The devils call this place a garden in jest, as barren sand under the rest of Kaolon, not served by any sunlight. The sand is coarse and itchy, the hair dry and overhot. One feels hungry, thirsty, even a bit faint, just standing here. The penitents here are mostly fierce, burly types. Some of them scarred, one or two look as though they rightfully should be dead. Hmm. Approach the penitent eight. What's it doing here? Hmm. He's collected human souls, and now he is here to cultivate them. Hmm. How do you even gain entry to the sand garden? He tells you in a low mutter, This soul was a gambler, but a good one, able to remember odds and figures, fat at seeing an opponent's bluff. Took bets where he shouldn't, calculated the odds of dying in a knife fight, and decided he didn't mind a 10% risk if the pot was large enough. A good soul, but it would be a better one if it could be coaxed, post-mortem, into a little more sense of mortality. That would make it more poignant. At least so you gather, the ep does not use words like poignant, but you'd take his meaning. Hmm. You're helping a Pentecost ape who would rather be other than he is. Ah, yes, the Pentecost apes. Penance excess and penance inescapable truth. Hmm. Interesting. Perhaps not for now. Oh, no, no. Uh, sorry. Do you want to go back there, but I'm not going to deal much with that one. Still will not be deterred. I'm going to gain a penance of endurance, if I can. Dangerous, perhaps, but here we are. How long can we last? Not very long. Five terror. An unintelligent man put to Z with an inadequate fuel and supply- Hey! Hey! I feel called out here. Until the penitent recovers from this inclination, he is listening to a series of lectures on the pointless misery of the grave. As for your punishment, it does not bear speaking of. Your stamina does not hold up. Hey. Fuck you. Hmm. <laughs> a surgeon refused to eat meat or to join the army for the penitent's own good. She's copying out a list of registered deaths. Ah. <sighs> I'll do this one more time. A famous strongman put to Z with inadequate fuel or supplies. As a corrective, he is sitting motionless and staring into a empty glass bowl. Very well. Enough of that. Ruthlessly cheerful young woman attempted to retrieve a friend from death and failed. As a corrective, she is meditating on the nature of non-existence. Good for her. Oh. <gasps> oh! To regard of death as a serious flaw. It displeases the Blue Kingdom. It makes the devils tut. But also, I could have brought hours here to do... Oh, gonna have to write that down. But okay. Okay, I can make this into something that works. Um. Hmm. My soul is not stained or flickering at the moment, but... <laughs> it's most every other flaw. Uh, let's go to this Gaslight Terrace. We have to anyway. For our little job here. Your companions are a lady in a buttoned cloak and a young male student. They talk among themselves about the seasonable warmth and about how the yellowish glow of the lamp does not show blue silk to best effect. Their words are commonplace, their hands folded and gloved. Their opinions supplied by a respectable gazette. You've almost forgotten them even when you are still walking together. The path descends by shallow steps to a broad terrace as crowded as an imperial exhibition. Ah, now this, this I can do. Well, that's interesting. Gaslight lamp posts are scattered irregularly across a flagstone and terrace. Between them are stations, each containing a patient received a, receiving a treatment. The supervising devils tend these stations, stopping first here and then there like bees at flowers. Approach the spineless curate. He sits in stocks, attended only by a devilish orderly. Hello. At the nearest station, a curate has been shackled into an ordinary pillory. His eyes beseech you to visit him. Let's meet this spineless curate. I've seen something in this light. It's hard not to see things. A devilish orderly jabs the curate with a needle. At the side of the jab, the curate's skin goes lavender. 
I'm being treated for not believing in God. I've tried everything. Prayer, fasting, long weekends with a professional saint. None of it worked. My sermons were suffering. My bishop complained. And has it helped? I have dreams of snakes and angels, he says. It hasn't made me a mystic. I don't think the devils are real either. Just men with funny eyes, aren't they? And the devilish orderly smiles with extra teeth. Uh, well, technically they're bees of a sort. A penance enlightenment and a penance shift of perspective. Or five enlightenment. Whew. Leave him to his penance for now? He's a long way from cured. I mean, I can do this five times and get rid of him real quick. Glassy-eyed nanny is prone to sloth and conversations about needlepoint. As punishment, she is having scales grafted to the skin. You feel any more interesting now? Asks the supervising devil. Huh. Vision, imagination, the ability to see beyond the nearest convention. That's what the devils are trying to evoke here. Hmm. Hmm. Madness. He's enduring an old-fashioned cupping. What? I am confused by this, but okay. I mean, I probably should cure my lightless soul at this point, but... Let's, uh, get five of these, just so we have. Actually, there is an achievement for having a very terrible soul, isn't there? Could just leave it for now. Meh. Let's take care of this. Pay in alternate currency. The carrier will hardly care how his rescue is achieved. There's a great deal of penance, and it is heavy. The pillory releases the curate, and he reels over to sit down at the base of one of the lamps. He has learned something from your enlightenment, and he does not say what it is. After a few minutes, the curate catches sight of a patrolling devil. Shaking, he gets to his feet. I have a warning for you. Meet me in the bell garden. It's harder for them to overhear us there. Then he heads to the center of Carillon, stumbling a little even on the shallow staircase. Interesting. To the bell tower, then. No heads turn, you brush past a matron in grey boots, a train conductor in his uniform, and a young boy who has already adopted an expression of fixed ennui. None of them notices you passing by, none of them shows any interest in your breaking this convention. To the bell garden, the ascent is rocky, the sound of chimes is audible all the way down here. You put your foot on the first step and the devil blocks you. Those who enter the bell garden must be in a proper state of hygiene, professor, he says. One to make, want to make things worse for the poor sufferers. He washes his hands in the fountain, stopping you must have been grubby work. You've been turned away for impurity. Well, write a port port first. Lovely as that is. Deliver the half glass empty while we're here. It's been a long while since we dealt with him. He was the prisoner over in the Clockwork Sun, as I recall. Who is mostly glass at this point. When you explain the empty's predicament, your rescued prisoner attracts a swarm of attention. The presiding deviless descends to meet your rescued prisoner. She taps his glass eye with a fingernail. A sun-touched soul, she muses, an eager flash of tongue at her lips, as we can take good care of him. The devils will care for him now. Two attendants wheel out of bed and gently help the empty climb in. A listless farewell. Oh my. Your last words with the empty are awkward and brief. He was never much of a conversationalist. He thanks you, and he seems happy to leave it at that. When you return to your train, you find a nervous young man waiting outside with a barrel of souls. The devilless told me to deliver these to you, he says. Said it was a fair trade for such a patient. Ah, uh, hmm. Well, I'm sure this is fine. This is fine. Why wouldn't it be? Oh. Interesting to note that. We will come back to this, but first, 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 travel around Carillon. Hmm. Hmm. Pedants shift to finish. He has stained soul to be admitted, so... Hmm. Perform a ritual purification to enable entrance to the bell garden, I see. Okay. Those who wish to enter the bell garden must first undergo lustrations and prayers. Pedants deprivation can be gained at the bell garden. Fair. Fountains, pebbles, shoes. First, remove your shoes. Wash your face from the fountain of fresh water and your feet in the basin of salt water. Walk across a patch of white sand, throwing a pebble over your left shoulder. Baffle any ill-omened thing that might be following you. Then sleep in a hammock on a private balcony where only patients may enter. Other patients, rather. When you wake up, eat a plain white bread with a salt crust. After all this, you will be ready. 
Okay, sure. Visit the bell garden. The stairs lead up to the highest and coldest point in Carillon. The bells ring louder as you climb. The music is mathematical and exact. Each note sounds for exactly the same length of time, the same duration that is required to ascend one step. No one passes anyone else on these stairs. In a tower over the bell garden, 12 devils ring a, char a change of 12 bells. The full peel will take 11,000 days to complete without intermission. From time to time, one devil relieves another, stepping in during the half minute when that particular bell is at rest. There are no errors. His mathematical music can be heard everywhere in Carillon, but his loudest here, impurity and imprecision, are not welcome. Don't have much, uh, hearts for that. A uh, conversation with this spineless curate, though, I'm curious. He's willing to talk to you here, under the cover of the constant bell ringing. No one else will hear. What do you want to tell me? He lips to your ear. This is the best garden, he says. Everything orderly, no one dressed up in pheasant outfits or waltzing backwards. But here's what I wanted to tell you. Watch out for the tall devil with the rose-colored gloves. He is embezzling the property. And the curate makes a curious gesture with one hand, as though he were winding noodles around a fork. Oh. When you look blank, he says, Spirit Phage! He's taking souls from the patients in secret before the presiding devil has a chance at them. I'm afraid he's going to get at me before I finish my term here. Ah. Interesting that. Rose-colored gloves, you say. I mean, we might as well try this. Oh. I'm shocked that that worked out. Price is paid. A night storm has been known to eat candied fire ants. In order to correct these flaws, he is not allowed to hear music or see the light of day. I trust you see, remarks the supervising devilist, why self-restraint is needed. As for your punishment, does not bear speaking of, etc., etc. Cure the fermented soul requires more penance. Perhaps you've eaten that which you should not. Perhaps you've come in contact with something unclean. At any rate, your soul is gone a bit off. Hmm. Approach a penitent nurse. She hurls in the corner, her face trapped in a grimace. She is huddled in a corner with cotton stuffed to her ears. Attempt to communicate with her. It's too loud to speak, certainly. You communicate in writing. She's been within the sound of the bells for 40 days. The clangor is starting to disrupt her mind. She begs you will help her, and out of your kindness, pay part of her penance for her. She would do the same for you. She is a very kind and forgiving soul. To convince you of this point, she scribbles down assurances, compliments, and a sketch of herself ministering to a leprous child. Uh-huh. Mix of deprivation and ordeal. Well, that is much more possible. Uh, where's ordeal in all this? Uh, return to Carillon, or return to the center of Carillon, rather. Front up to spray anything, stairs down are more terrifying than the stairs up. They often are. Twelve changes of twelve bells before you reach the bottom again. No one else is on this stair. The penitents look up curiously when you arrive back at the center of Carillon. Uh, ordeal is the Sunted Grove. Very good. You know, I think I'm going to keep my soul broken as it is. Just because this is going to be a lot harder if I don't. Ah, oh dear. The thorn... well, there's no real gate. No, nope, going from the start here. At the center of Carillon, a half-height grove of blackthorn bushes. There's no real gate, but not much of a wall either. There's only one low stone barrier. Perhaps a foot tall, easy to step over. The thorn bushes grow thorns an inch or more long. There are paths between them, but it's hard to pass by without tearing one's clothes. The devils who work here have scratches on their forearms, though they don't seem to mind, as it's not a single comfortable place to sit. Gain a penance of ordeal. The punishments here are particularly physical in nature. Pretty good chance of success. Let's go for it. A lady emptied a chamber pot over a bridal procession. Wow, okay, why'd you do that? For the penitent's own good, she's being forced to copy out the obituaries of departed wives and beloved husbands. The supervising deviless makes notes. Curious, that. Approach the professional penitent. She's seated on a stool, eating vast quantities of sorbet. She collects penance for other people. Oh, sort of like what I'm doing. Speak with the professional penitent. It's a slow process, but the quality is better than the indulgent penance one may buy from the presiding deviless. The penitent is seated on a stool, eating from an enormous barrel of violet sorbet. It's enough to supply a carnival. The penitent's lips are blue. Her fingers are sticky. There are purple smears on her frock. Wasps are taking an interest in the side of her face. When you come over, she puts down her spoon long enough to greet you. I'm here on behalf of Viscountess, who doesn't love her children. He's waiting back in London for me to deliver her penance. Pointedly, the supervising devil sets another long-handled spoon at her elbow. Hmm. 
could do. Donate ordeal and deprivation to the professional penitent. She likely has a use for these for her current customer or for a future one. She accepts both penitents gratefully. Let me pay you, she says. Deprivations are not my favorite. I still do them, of course. There's nothing I won't live through for a client. But the fasting gets dull. So nice to be able to stock this without having to do it myself. Hmm. Interesting. I don't really see how these work in a more broad sense, but okay. I mean, that's what it is. It's buying indulgences. I get that aspect of it. But I wonder. Going back to the Bell Garden, which is going to take some time. Yes, yes, I know. I'm amazing. Look at my mirrors. They're wonderful. Here's the Bell Garden once again. Hmm. You're a little slower than I would like. But regardless, um, I think she does need deprivation. Which may or may not happen today. I'm only going to go up to 40 in terms of terror. Well, there we are. Good success. But yeah, I'm not willing to destroy my soul for this, but... I'm willing to make some extra money here. Donate a mix of deprivation or an ordeal to the nurse. What good is control if it doesn't come with strength? Fear, sir. You donate your pens to her. She struggles. The penance was painful to perform. It's not easy to receive, either. On the way down the staircase, she tells you about the hospital where she used to work. Administrators who stole from the medical funds, doctors who drank before surgeries. Some meant well, some meant poorly. Can't say I did much about it. Didn't want to be too harsh with the ones that were trying, she says. But I should have done, for the patient's sake. Hmm. Good use of savage secrets here. Yep. And keep going. Hmm, and actually, looking at the timer, hmm. Well. Let's go and attend our candlelit soiree with the inconvenient on. She insisted it will do you good. Come on, she says, a fierce gleam behind her spectacles. Your aunt, chatting constantly, guides you through the ash-gray stone chambers of Carillon. Eventually, you reach a little door in one of the less traveled back ways. Your aunt knocks thrice. The door swings open. A severe, scarred old woman beers out, peers out. Bunty! Your aunt cries happily. After a brief introduction, Bunty ushers you inside. Bunty? You emerge into a room with a high mirrored ceiling. Its dark paneled walls are illuminated by dripping crimson candles. Revolutionaries consult with ministry auditors. Devils drink with bright-eyed ministers of the new sequence. A famous tackety general is highly occupied with a distinguished admiral. What has she brought you to? Uh, Mingle. It's a party. Besides, your aunt can look after herself, probably. Huh. You introduce yourself to very many personages, some great and good, most borderline criminal. Everyone seems to believe you already know the rules, so you learn a number of surprising things about the information networks of the high wilderness. Most crucially, the extent to which their frequent contact breeds certain mutual understandings. Suddenly, you hear the familiar crunch of boiled sweets at your ear. Your aunt has returned. Her expression is a guest. Let's get out of here. I learned something about a rendezvous at St. Dunstan's. She refuses to say more here. Oh. Well. I mean, I don't need to blackmail them. Besides, I'm not a big fan of Spearphage in general. So, yes, there's many things we could and perhaps should do, but... Turn in the spear fire. You know what he did. She should know also. He's diminishing her supply, after all. You lay out what you know. The rose-gloved devil has been stealing souls for himself and not making proper contracts for them either. Spearfidge, she says. And I warned him. After a moment, her attention returns to you. He had a very different soul when we first met. This is a trouble with friendship among devils. Come back in five years' time, and who knows? You may find me engaged in a smuggling operation of my own. Probe into the nature of devil's souls. She may think it unsuitable for a human to know the answer to such questions. In fact, it might truly be unsuitable to know, but I need to know, you see. That's the thing. I want to know. Oh. She takes out a bottle soul and sets it on her desk. When I got this, it was blazing white in its bottle. Supposedly from a poet saint. And now look, rusty pipe water. Devil souls change on their own. And she adds, not like yours. You knew you shouldn't ask.
Hmm. That doesn't tell me anything at all. Wow. The devils of Carillon claim to be experts in the assessment and improvement of the soul. They would describe yours as overrich, cindered, and irrevocably damaged. Well. Hmm. Ah, if I had all the penances. But only one of them. Okay. Hmm. I mean, I'm pretty close to being able to do that. And now that I've done that, actually, I'm wondering. Observe the casting out of the spare fire just because. The presiding deviless is haranguing the spare fire in her beehive office. Looks as though the interview will not last much longer. There they go. He's not allowed to take anything with him. Not a case, not a hat, not even clothing. The presiding devilless makes him strip down to the courtyard, in the courtyard, to show he hasn't got any spare soles tucked into his trousers. The penitents... The penitents I've seen plenty of humiliations lately, but generally inflicted on humans. They watch the Spearfire's progress in a spirit of ill-concealed jubilation. Nude and slump-shouldered, he walks to the port. After he is gone, the presiding devilist takes a curious two-pronged fork from her desk and flings it into the fountain. The water seethes. And with that, I gain ten savage secrets. Ooh, okay. Interesting. Okay. Travel around Carillon, I wonder if I have access to another place. I do. So close to being truly broken in terms of souls. But this is more of a sort of thing I need to explore later. Perhaps much later once I've gotten that last flaw in. But for now, thank you for your time. Another like, comment, and subscribe buttons below. Use them responsibly, and I will see you all soon.